Cool, and we're on. So, cool. Curry, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah, sorry, I a little uh, ran over a little bit there. Rob, uh, Rob wouldn't stop talking. Well, nah, <laughs> probably me. So, he went. <laughs> not a problem. So you sound busy, so I completely understand. <laughs> ah, no, sorry again. Um, I'm trying to. Yeah, I never. Know. My first week of my first round of these, I, I was I booked like 20 minutes and found out after about. 25 minutes so that's just that was not long enough so the next one i uh, booked 40 minutes and now i'm just like ah oh, you know what maybe i'll just do two of these a day that's it so <laughs> right. you're, you're in uh hubbard ohio is that correct yeah so i'm in hubbard which is uh around youngstown ohio which is um again south of cleveland and uh west of uh pittsburgh okay all right, I've, I've driven, yeah, driven through Ohio a few times down near, near that way. So, um, what's the youngest age group you've coached? So, um, right now, I'm doing uh, trains with U8. So, okay. basically five, six, seven, eight-year-olds. So, that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, my full-time coaching, if you can call it that, is I'm a high school coach for varsity. But I've also worked with my our U14 youth teams, both boys and girls, our U12 teams as well. So I do quite a bit. Excuse me. <coughs> no, you're that, that must be quite the – do you find you have to uh, – there must be a lot of switching personalities from your five, six, seven, eights to the your varsity right. high school. Yeah, I guess what it definitely is. So you have to treat each kid a little bit. I mean, each kid needs to be treated differently in a way anyways. But uh, yeah, switching gears from how empathetic I need to be and how um, more direct I need to be, you know, from those age groups. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. But the good thing is, is that um, I'm uh, my day job, which I would love this coaching be my day job, but my day job is actually as a, uh, therapist. I run a truancy program um, so and behavior specialist. So I'm doing that all day long anyways. So yeah, I just, with all I age groups, all parents. Uh, when you sort of sent me a message, I was looking at your, your Twitter bio there and I'm like, hmm, this guy might be able to help me actually with a with a hell of a lot, of, especially with the the behavior part. So we're going to, I'd like to pick your brains on that. Um, Absolutely. For sure. So, um, how many, how many times a week with the, with the younger kids are you coaching? And is that like in a local, like, is it the, you know, is it elite premier level or? No, it, it's just our community, community kids. Um, so here in Hubbard, just our community kids. I do that uh, with a couple, two other, three other coaches. Um, one being my brother, one being my cousin, and then a friend of ours. And it really started because, um, so, Actually, we've had the, it's called the Eagle Academy. We did this about five years ago, running just small groups for our U8 to U14. I mean, it was typically one day a week. So right now it's just Wednesdays for an hour, you know, with U8 kids keeping attention span and 15 minute uh, activities. You know, that's pretty much what we are able to get them without losing focus. Um, so, but, so about five years ago, we did the Eagle Academy program. And then it kind of dropped off where uh, we weren't really getting finding facilities and time and stuff was kind of difficult for us. Uh, so I turned it into like more of a coaching education for parents. So the Eagle Cat, so it's a Facebook page. So I, I went to more of like just my thoughts and um, really focusing on the younger kids and educating parents on why we do what we do and how to improve their kids because I think parents are the keys to their development. Uh, a kid's development. So we did that. Um, so like right now, what's yeah, some of the Eagle stuff Academy. you're, sorry, what's, what's some of the stuff that you're working with or trying to, uh, what, what kind of messages are you trying to get across to the parents of, of those kids and how, how are you involving them in, in, the, in the, in the process? Right. So um, we're, Right now, so I, you know, I read Tom Byer's book, um, yep. Soccer Starts at Home, and uh, for the last couple of years, I've been really using a lot of uh, material from that. 
uh, really trying to, again, get parents to realize that they're the key. A small ball in the home, let them dribble and, and stuff like that and really focus on. So um, I, I, Tom just sent out a thing for 48 books for like five bucks a book. So we're doing that to give back to the parents. Um, he's also doing where he'll do a, set up a Zoom meeting with them. Uh, so we're going to try to do that. But my engagement has been really more just through the Facebook page and talking to parents when they come and say, well, what can I do to get my kids, you know, to help them develop? These are the things you can do, you know, get a ball in the home, turn on the music, let them dance on the ball, you know, make it fun, get in and do it with them. Um, because we'll that's to me. We'll play with your kid. A young, <laughs> play with your kid. Absolutely. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yep. Uh, someone had asked me the one day, you know, you know, what is it? I said, it's basically therapy, but you're doing it with your kid. You're involving yourself nonstop, you know, you're, you're, and it's good for you. It's good for your health as well. You know, so. Yeah, for sure. So, so how many in your current setup with your, you, uh, you, uh, how many, how many kids you get, are you, are you um, coaching? So again, we train on Wednesday. They have about uh, 25 that come to that. And then, through one of our local uh, facilities um, here, it's, it's the next town over, we actually play on uh, Saturday mornings at eight o'clock. So we get those kids and we play uh, small sided games, uh, 4v4s, 5v5s, uh, you know, depending on the number of kids there, we to try to keep them all included at the same time. We split the field into three small sided fields and we, we play for an hour, trying to keep the coaching within it you know, very minimal. Um, I'm really encouraging our coaches, if you're going to make a, a coaching point, you know, 30 seconds at the most, you know, kind of overcorrect, have them redo it, and then let them play. So that's it's, pretty much where our setup is right now. Yeah, it's it's kind of encouraging to hear. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing just in a brief few conversations I've had so far, I'm like that, you're the second person that sort of said, we get together with another club. Just the two of us, and we come, and we play, and it sounds like that's going to be a far better environment for those kids than travel, competitive at that age. How did how did that come about? Like, how did you develop that, and how how's it going? How do you how do you feel it's going? Yeah. So, um, the, actually, the the team or the facility that we're utilizing. My daughters and so I have a, a, a five and a, a seven year old, um, and then my cousin, his daughters play there. Uh, they're uh, eleven and six, so they actually train over at this club team as well. And the coach there, I've known him my whole life. When I played, we had a club team at YSU. He was one of the coaches, so it was kind of already a relationship that was built. And my niece and nephews played through there that club as well. Um, so we told him what we were doing, and we said we wanted to see if we can get some scrimmages against his team, so his U8 kids. And he's like, just bring them all over, and we'll we'll have uh, uh, the weekly session or weekly games with them, and it'd just be your kids. And he says, and if any of our U8 kids want to jump in, he says, we'll we'll include them all together. And we're like, perfect. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. Have you stayed pretty much like? split or have you mixed any of the two clubs together and made like that kind of format at all yeah so it is mixed yeah the, the kids are mixed together so like if i'm so what we did is the first week um we were trying to go more like age-wise until we started to see developmentally you know where they're so chronological age over developmental age um so we put basically all five-year-olds together and then we had like the six and sevens and then the eight year olds together. And so both teams were together. So the Eagle Academy, the TCSC kids were together. And, um, and it worked out really well uh, because again, the numbers were perfect. So it was four v fours and pretty much every group except for the five, five year olds, they were five v five. Um, and it was good coaching and kids enjoyed it. Parents seemed to enjoy it. So it worked out. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a great, model a great initiative i think like rather than throwing these kids into a travel or competitive league like just getting they just want to be play with other kids right and play against other kids with other kids that seems like a very yeah yeah uh, you're 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 kind of you're getting that aspect of it 
but also yeah. working closely with someone like another i just that's rare i i, I is, is that normal is it happening more or like are you are you a trailblazing pioneer at this because i know <laughs> that, that, that is very unlikely to happen anytime soon right well see again because we're just more of like a you know like we're really trying to change the culture here in our our community you know we have considered rec league and, and you know listening to your other podcast it's kind of the i i'm, I'm completely agree with what you've been saying and you know like some of the things twitter so we have our rec league and then we have our travel league and then we have the kids who go and play club but then we also have our high school team and we're not together it's it's, it's really we've been trying but we're all on set different pages like so the rec league is fun for all you know it's uh it's very little um actual training so they play they train maybe once a week and actually my daughters were in that league the last two years and i coached it with my cousin and we had no practices because we had no time for it um but we had three games per week in the matter of seven weeks yeah it was tough yeah, yeah, three games so, a week but no time for practice <laughs> no time for practice so so it's basically it that, that we just go down to two games a week and one practice we, we've talked about that you know and trying to get that to change so that, like I said, it, it's, it's basically fun for all, you know, and we're, I don't want to say it's, it's not there for the development because it's there for the social emotional development for the kids. And the, so, but like the soccer development, that's where it's missing. The travel program that we have is kind of, it's more, it's very competitive and it's one of those when at all cost programs, <laughs> you know, and so it's, can't we just make something that's in the middle for everyone? Right. Yeah, so that's what we're trying to do with the Eagle Academy is make it grassroots soccer. There, there's no level. It's all, we're all under the same page. They're not my kids. They're not the next coach's kids. They're not the, the uh, um, our community league's kids. They're Hubbard's kids, you know, so that we're all under the same umbrella and we work together. You know, I'm willing to do whatever I – like I said, my, at this point, and I said the same to my cousin, we're being selfish because these are our daughters growing up through this program now. And we want to see, we really need to see some change for our daughter's success, you know? So at some point in your coaching life, you have to become selfish, I guess, you know, and I've been doing this for 20 some years. Wow. <laughs> um, but at this point, I'm to the point of like, we need change. My, it's finally hitting more home to me. I've already seen it at the high school level where it's been detrimental. Um, and now, like with our daughters, it's like we really need to see something change. Now, getting back to combining with uh, the TCSC, the other club, is because we're just a grassroots program just trying to work on um, improving the kids and educating the parents as to what the levels are and how we, you want your kid to develop. Well, development starts at home, and we can help out with that, but it needs to be reinforced. Now, getting with the club team um, was, like I said, we have a relationship anyways uh so it was kind of just it happened and you know it's worked out for us he's yeah. on the same page with us his club so the the tcsc club team um i want to say there's probably around maybe between the boys and girls 150 maybe 200 kids in the program from u8 to u19 um and he runs he's really um skill oriented so they really work on the, the, the player's skills uh, more. So, and I don't want to say more so than the team aspect because they definitely do all that, but the main focus is on development of players. And it kind of fit into what our Eagle Academy was, especially for the younger kids. Uh, so like I said, it just worked out perfect for us. So what are you currently, what does a session look like with your, um, with your U8? Um, the, the U8? Yep. Yeah. U8. Uh, anyone under U8? It sounds like you've got like six, seven, five, it, six. It is seven. actually five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. So we basically it's U5, U8, or I mean, yeah. So U6 is U8 is what we're looking at um, player wise. Um, we've kind of adapted and changed, you know, again, so we're trying to go like, we'll come in and we have a setup for them to come in and play just so that's their warm up. They come in and we try to get them to try to get four or five year olds to eight year olds to just 
organize their own small sided game has been very difficult as a warm up. But we're trying to get them just to think, you know, if we to just start doing that. Come in the field setup, the the balls are there for you to play, you know, get a couple, make some passes and organize. We're helping organize that as well. But do you, do you, still, do you still run into the well, where do I go? What team am yeah. I on? Yes, yeah. Yeah. So that's where the organization from the coaches comes in, but we're trying to step back and just give them that freedom. So then once the session starts, then we have one group. So we had them all together at one point and it was just chaos, nonstop chaos. And then we started to separate them, like kind of, I have a group for 15 minutes. The other coach has a group for 15 minutes and then we just rotate them and it's worked out a little bit better. And we still kind of keep them closer to the age group of what they are. Um, but the sessions, they what they look like are, we have, um, Skills. So one, the, the one coach Perry, he's doing uh, mostly skills with them, like uh, the Ronaldo chop, the step overs and scissors, and uh, the Cruyff turns and stuff like that. Um, trying to get what we can. So every kid has a ball. In so they might like rotate to mine. I'm trying to do like four versus zero rondos. Some of the older ones maybe a four versus one rondo, um, and really get. So we're working on their passing and working on um, just getting having them have their head up you know, as much as we possibly can, you know, uh, just to, uh, so they can start seeing those things. So you kind of, you'll see each group of kids at your yeah. activities. So how, how do you manage that when you've got, all right, so this group is the seven, you know, seven, eight year olds that mm -hmm. are maybe a lot further on than, Oh, these are the five sixes. I, how do you, do you have an activity and you have in your, do you make that, adjust that activity and run it with the same? Or do you have, okay, I need three different activities tonight. How do you approach that? Um, so like, so like, let's like say this Wednesday we were doing a round. It was four versus zero. I had, what I started off with was the, um, the uh, seven and six year olds. And we did four, four over here and it was just passing along. And what I went in, I jumped in the middle. So we had two groups going at once. So I jumped in the middle and was just trying to get them to recognize if I'm standing here between you and B, like player B, where, which way are you going to pass? You know, oh, obviously I'm going to go here or there, you know, across. So I'm not going to pass into you. So getting them to recognize that. So then uh, like they were just passing and, pass is not perfect you know and just getting them to use the inside of their foot getting them to receive with sometimes their weak foot and then you know a little bit of opening up and you know receiving just as an introductory um so and, and it went actually really well <laughs> then the next group comes in let's say i had the uh five-year-olds at yeah. this point so the, so what i had to do there was now i'm just focusing on just the passing inside of our foot and running to the ball, not waiting it to come to us. So now I get them, um, let's say my daughter passes to player A, instead of her sitting there waiting for it, come on, come on, you got to run with it. Let's run to it. So let's get it. And now let's turn the ball, use one of our skill moves, and now let's pass it over to player C. You know, so now I'm just in incorporating uh, more individual. With same, them. same activity, but now just the, the focus has changed to a different uh, technical point. Yep, yeah. So and then the last group comes in, the best group. But yeah, the, so the older group, now I'm really focusing on getting them to, uh, again, inside of our foot, receive across our body, uh, constant movement, and maybe a four versus one, and let's see if we can get it more intense. Let's see if we can pick up that intensity, you know, still keeping it at the level of players that are there. So you have you, your approach is, I got one activity, and I have to be able to progress the activity, make it more difficult for this group, Mm -hmm. and then scale it back a little bit and make it easier for this group. Right. But yeah. they're all so, like, they're all learning the same activity though, right? Pretty much, yeah. 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 Pretty much, yeah. The same focus is there. Yeah, like, again, you know, thinking about it, like with my background in like the um, psychology and child development areas is like recognizing each, each developmental levels and then also each kid, what level they're at. And I really try to focus on that so it's more of an it's an it's a group but individual how can i focus on this individual here 
who's not getting as much as well? You know, how can I get them to do a little bit more? So let's, let's do, I want to give you a few, I'm trying to think quickly uh, <laughs> with regards to that, what you were talking about, your expertise in behavioral um, kids and how do you, and, and maybe you could help other coaches and, and myself understand like what's just completely normal for a, for the typical kid, right? So um, sure. we, when we're talking about this five, six, seven year old uh, group, how, what, what do you find with the kids that just have less of an attention span, right? The kid, I mean, I was having a discussion with a parent the other day and I know what my kind of thoughts on it were, but she was, the mom was kind of saying to me, well, I need you, you've got to be harder on her, right? Because, you know, she's doing like a cartwheel in the middle of the, you know, in the middle of practice. And, and my sort of answer was, she's six. Right. I, I'm like, I've been doing this long enough that I've, your, your kid is not the first one that has busted out multiple cartwheels in the middle of practice or even in a game. Like, right. what, how, how do you deal with, how do you deal with that? Like, what, what do you, so, as an well, It's funny you, you say about cartwheel. So we were in the summer, we were running sessions and my little cousin, she started doing cartwheels on my knee. Then, then my, um, my daughter started doing cartwheel. So what I, I, I took it incorporated into our session and we were doing a four versus zero rondo. So I told him every time you made a complete pass, you can do a cartwheel, you know? So I, I there, it's still an activity, you know, to me, it's, yeah, we're here for soccer, but we're also here for the, again, the social, uh, we're here for the psycho, uh, psycho psychological, we're here for the technical. Um, so I, I really incorporated that as well into our, so every time you made a, a complete pass, go and do a cartwheel. You know, yeah. Maybe explaining. So maybe fight it. <laughs> What's that? So maybe don't fight it as much and, and incorporate right. it. Incorporate it, yeah. I had a kid who um, didn't want to get involved. Like he was very shy, not wanting to get involved. I noticed he had a, a Spider-Man shirt on. So I walked over and, and acted like I was shooting him with a, with a web. And next thing you know, he came in and, and the activity was, you know, you set out all the cones and you're dribbling through the cones. So I told him, I said, we're, we're Spider-Man. We're getting from building to building. And we just got to get from one side to the other. And then we got to make it back, you know, with this ball, the ball is who you're going from building to building with. And he got on and dribbled through the, through the cones with me while the other kids are dribbling through the cones as well. So we got to watch out for the, the, the villains coming at us and stuff. So kind of just incorporating what, uh, who they are and what their motivation is. Um, kid with a short attention span, find out what their motivation is. Why are they there? First of all, are they there for just because their parents want them there? Do they want to learn? Do they love soccer? And what other things do they like outside of soccer? And kind of, is there, that, you might increase their attention span by 10 seconds. <laughs> so with that, there's, so there's, there's a, another, another good one. So how, how would you advise, you know, grassroots coaches again like five six seven eight the kid that just doesn't really want to be there like they're not you know like you said maybe it's more mom or dad is putting them in the activity but they have a low interest level in soccer and they may not be uh um you know adversely affecting the, the session or group but you know low ability low attention span low mm -hmm. interest like, does there come a point where it's a lost cause, or how, how do you? How do you? Yeah. I, I find that very. I find that difficult. Yeah. Um, don't don't get me wrong. You know that's come across my mind. Am I able to get to him, or is it? Can somebody else, one of our other coaches, get to him or her to bring them into the thing? Like I said, I think it's kind of more of getting down to their level of what is their motivation, what's their interest. That's my daughter. You just described my daughter. She comes, she does my youngest, my five-year-old. She doesn't want to participate. A lot of uh, stress and anxiety. Um, like, unless I'm there, which is not what I wanted at all, you know, she's 
are you going to be there? Are you coaching? Yes, I'm coaching today. Okay, then I'll go. And then she gets out there and she uh, needs her ball, not only her ball. She wants to only do um, what, things with me when she's got to go everywhere. So I really encourage the other coaches and even some of the other kids is we get down with them and we understand who they are and what so we're basically focusing on that one kid probably almost for the whole session to really get them in so that they're having fun and want to come back the next time. Again, the six-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, you know, it's, you're not really losing much with as far as like, um, I guess you got to look at that one. You're not losing much because these kids are, they're still young. They're developing, you know, so many different ways that one session to focus on one kid is not going to be a big deal. So it's more a case of just trying to really, and maybe we don't, maybe a lot of us as adults, we don't, we're not comfortable. We don't do that. Right. It's, it's, right. it's actually talk to that five or six year old about mm. why are you here? What, what do you like about being here? What do you not like about being here? Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose it does, does there come a time where it's just like, this is just not your thing, man. Um, yeah, I think there are, there's definitely some where you're, there's going to come a time. Um, um, I like to say that, you know, let the, the player and the parents kind of decide that rather than me as a coach. Um, I've never gone and told anybody that they might not be, you know, perfect, but I might say, what other things do they do? You know, yeah. do they, do they, do they, like, um, they into music or are they into like theater? Or are they into, you know, cause, cause I can tell that they like, they like to dance around. Maybe dancing is what they want to do, you know? What about the, again, thinking of the same kind of age group? This is great. This is like therapy. I'm just pouring out all my problems. <laughs> you're uh, you're, you're going to tell me it's not me. I find, that, <laughs> I find that within a lot of our groups, I have, there's a percentage of players that they're kind of, let's say, on a percentage scale, they're always between 50 and 70% in terms of their effort level their ability level their behavior level their attention span they're always just kind of like on a good day it's 70 percent. on a bad day it's 50 percent. and then i have some other players that from session to session week to week it's just and, and my my youngest girl is one of these it can be 20 percent some days and it can be 90% other days. Right. And especially if that's your kid, right? <laughs> right. It's just, yeah, yeah. I, I shake my head. I'm just like, why? Like, like, again, is that, what's, what, is that normal? And what do you find, what, what's causing that? And, and is there anything we can do to, like that wild oh, swing in, like, you know, one minute, you know, my eight year old is, I'm like, wow. She's just beaten two players, and today she was just you know, passing the ball, scoring goals, defending. And then the, the next week, it's like, I, I almost, and I probably have many times, just asked her, like, have you ever played this game before? Have you <laughs> right. been at soccer for the last four years? Obviously, you know, I try not to, to say that to other kids, but with your own kid, it's just like, right. what's, what, what's going on there? So that's kind of, that's loaded, um, because... We never know what's going on in the kid's home life. You know, what's happening at school. We never know what, you know, what's going on in their social life with peers. Um, no matter what age group, whether it's the five-year-olds to the 19-year-olds. And it's normal for, I think, for kids to have that. I mean, we all hear all the time that some kids just, they're, they're better players and they're trainers. So they, they, they don't give 100% effort at um, uh, practice. But when you get them onto a game, man, like they're like typically w with the top five kids on the team, you know, no matter what. But you're, and you're thinking, how can I get this kid to train harder? And if I can get this kid to train harder, he'll be a better player. When in probably reality, training's not his thing. He can't, he's probably just struggling attention span and stuff. Um, the, I just found out about one. So we had a foreign exchange student come to our high school this year. And, uh, the, the the house parent told me he says hey did you know he has ADHD I'm like there's no way I knew that like I'm here I am you know I work in behavioral health and uh, um, I'm a therapist and I was like 
I didn't even know he had, you know, uh, ADHD and stuff. I said, because he's always focused at practice. I was like, he gives us 100%. And then boom, it dawned on me. He's hyper-focused. Soccer is his focus of, of like what really drives him in. So you got to kind of find what that kid's focus is, um, whether they're ADHD or not, you know, no matter what, like everybody has a focus. Mine, soccer as well. I was a quiet kid. But when you get me on the field and you get me talking about coaching, man, I'll talk nonstop. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's you got to find again back to that kid motivation and that focus of what they really like to do and how you can incorporate that into their sessions or their training. But are you, are you kind of saying a lot of the time it, it's probably with that kid that's up and down? It's external factors like what's happened yeah. before or outside of practice, or maybe they just. Mm-hmm. What happened at school? Right. Yeah. And sometimes that just might be, uh, and maybe I wouldn't expect um, a kid to tell me everything that's going on, but maybe just put, put an arm around him and say, hey, what's going on? You know, I noticed that yesterday you were at 75%. Today you're at uh, 25%. Yeah. What's the difference? You know, what, what's going on? I'm always here. Open door policy. Come talk to me. Five-year-old probably not going to be able to cognitively discuss those things. Um, that might just be more of trying just to make their day better, you know, by, by getting down on their level, making it fun for them. And I guess as, as coaches trying not to show our frustration at that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I, and I like guilty of it too. Like it's, man, you, you, you did so well, but the, what's going on today, you know, like in your head, you're like, is it me? Is it my session? So you're constantly evaluating in that. And sometimes it can just be, like I said, those external things that are happening outside. And, and I think that's where, again, where that comes in and just realizing, and it's hard to know every single one of our kids, but maybe taking a few minutes a day to, to just talk to them, you know, multiple ways. Like, so we meet with them at the field. You might have text messages or in fact, I uh, was having a hard time with my high school kids getting them to communicate, you know, sending out messages to them. Finally, I joined Snapchat as a high school program. And the, the amount of um, interaction I get from them is, is like probably 30 times more than what I had the last couple of years because, like, I found something that they enjoyed, they wanted. Yeah, they had it there into. Mm-hmm. What are some of the other typical, like, with this age group, um, behavioral kind of issues that we see it? What about the kids that, you know, we, we all have them, right, that we get frustrated? They're just always messing around, never listening, right? Like, how, how can we deal with those players a, a little bit? better rather than you know obviously the typical go sit out and punishment methods like right you know, what's what do you what do you think yeah. kind of causes that right like they're they're just it, it's just hard to get them to focus on the task mm-hmm. is it you know i mean and sometimes obviously maybe it is the task but yeah, but yeah um again that's just what, normal um yeah, I mean, I think it's normal for kids to, to do that. I mean, you're, you're getting a bunch of kids who um, maybe eight, nine, ten, ten year olds who they want to be kids. They're here for the social aspect of the sport. They love the sport, but they're there for the social aspect as well. Um, and we as adults, we're there for the sport. We're there to coach. But the kids, yeah, I mean, their, their motivation might be, hey, I just want to be involved. I want to be I want to be here with my friends. You know, you, you split teams up. First thing is, can I go over be with Johnny? I want to be with Michael. You know, that's who I want to be with. Um, and typically, you know, that, that's probably who they're going to be over there fooling around with, talking with the whole time. Um, but I would say in dealing with that would be catch them being good. Catch them being, uh, you know, you've been working on step overs and you know, like step overs and going into space with penetration, you know, quick. You see them do it, boom, praise them for it, you know, and not just but praise. Right. Hey, I just watched you do that step over and you went straight into that space and, you know, and, and you got away from the defender and, and you created a goal scoring opportunity, you know, so constantly trying to catch them being, okay. being, catch them being good. So when, so when we, when we find that rare moment where they are listening and they do yeah. like really like kind of emphasize that and 
give them positive reinforcement for that rather than the right. typical negative reinforcement for not for not listening. It, it might even be the, the that the walk over to the group. He's not fooling around in the group, and you say to the whole group, oh, "Awesome guys, you all came in real quick. We can make this thirty seconds a quick thirty second talk. You know, you did wonderful. Maybe point out. You know, I like the way that you maybe he. Sometimes you can even stretch what they did and kind of put your own uh, your own observation in there. Like maybe he just walked over and he had he said to someone, hey, be quiet. He said, hey, look, you, you were a leader there. You told him that you need to settle down. You wanted to hear what's happening. You know, so again, you're catching them being good. You added a little bit more to it. And that probably boosts boost his, uh, his ego there for a little bit too. Is there anything like – any strategies or tips you have, like if you're trying to run an activity and you just you just can't get them to focus or get it done, like and you feel as a, you know, I, I feel it myself, right? As a coach, or I'm just I'm getting pissed off and I'm getting right. frustrated with this, and I'm like, I I need to change something here. Yeah. Typically for me, I would just revert into a game. I'd be like, okay, you know what? We just this. This isn't working out. Mm -hmm. Let's go three v three or whatever it is. I want you to just get back, get back into a game where I guess it's. I guess that's more for me, where I can be yeah. less frustrated and just be like, okay, if yeah. you want to mess around in the game a bit more, I'm fine with that. You're not ruining my activity, right? So, so the, um, it's funny you say that's more for you as coaches, and and I do that as well, and I stress this to the. Um, uh, the other coaches that uh, I work with is that if we are focused, if we're putting too much talk, if we're talking too much, the kids are going to start to fold around. If, if the, the session is not designed for the specific group, they're going to fold around because they're losing focus again. And it's too difficult. They don't understand it. I said, so always design something that's for the group you're working with. Um, we tend as I think coaches as well, we want to work on what we think we need to work on what yeah. the team needs, but it's not necessarily what the team needs. It's the players need something to keep their focus as well. Again, that social, social psychology or psychological part of it. Um, so in the activity, so keep it to that. If it's not working out, it's more than just, if it's more than just that one uh, kid who's fooling around, now you got three or four of them. Boom. I'm, I'm, I'm right with you for my own sanity. Um, I'm going straight into a three V three or I'm changing the activity and say, Hey, go get a quick drink. Let's come in. This isn't working. Um, and admit to my, my mistake. Look, I made a mistake. It, it didn't work out today and I'm not pulling the energy. So let's go into something else, you know? And I think that recognizing that when, they, recognizing when to just go to something they like, go to something they, that, that's going to get them yeah. away from that behavior rather than banging your head against the wall and, and getting more and more worked up. Right. Now everything does consequence. So, we don't want them to think, oh, I can do this all the time. Right. You know, so, so maybe you do have it, put it just into another activity, you know, or you make the 3v3 and you say, hey, it's 3v3, but it's not just 3v3. I'm coaching within this 3v3. We're going to work on something specific in this 3v3, you know, so that it's not, uh, oh, yeah, I got out of practice today. We, we all did it to the substitute teacher at school, didn't we? <laughs> you know, so it was. Get them now, I just found, I found the answer there. Now you're telling me there's a downside to it as well. <laughs> right. But, like you said, everything I think does have a consequence, but you know, if we prepare for those consequences as well, you know, then things start to go a little bit smoother. With with our younger players, five, six, seven. What's your thoughts on in terms of? I've heard coaches and instructors tell me. You can't teach certain things to that age group. Like they just, they can't comprehend it. What do you, what you, from a behavioral point of view, now obviously I, obviously I would agree that five, six, seven year olds are not going to really be able to comprehend how to play a four, one, two, three, one. Right. But in terms of, understanding basic concepts and principles mm -hmm. and not just technical things 
in your experience and your like training, like, can you teach that to a five, six, seven year old? I think five, six, seven year olds are a lot smarter than us adults get. Um, and one of the reasons I say, so like my daughter, she's not one of those, my seven year old, and she just turned seven. She's not one of those kids who wants to get into, you know, you see that beehive uh, clump of kids all running around together. She sits on the outside of it. So just a little conversation. Why, why you stand on the outside and you're not in there trying to get the ball? And her response was, well, first, she doesn't want to fall and get hurt. I'm watching those kids fall and get hurt. They're getting stepped on. Consciously, she's thinking, I'm not doing that. Yeah. The second is, if that ball comes out, I can get it. You know, so she's thinking in that term. So then, um, so I took that concept and said, okay, you know, now I'm going to try to push this a little bit. We were watching, I'm a Liverpool fan. So we're wa- Saturday mornings, you know, sitting there watching games. And I'm like, so I'm just pointing out, uh, obviously, I'm not talking about formation. I'm not talking about the movements and stuff, but I'm talking about with her the space and saying, who's open? Which player is open there? And so I pause it and she'll say, well, a guy's ball. Oh, he can, she can pass it. He can pass to him. Why? Because he's facing that, that way. Boom. Now you're starting to see some of that spatial awareness. I think kids are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. It, it, and that could be taught, but we got to be creative on how we actually teach it. We can't just go in and right. I can't teach it the same way I teach my, my uh, 14, 15, 16 year old. Now I got to be more open-ended questions. Um, again, uh, reflections and summary with the kid and be very um, creative in, in how we do it. You know, there's no wrong answer either. So, <laughs> so we just, we have to find ways that are appropriate for their, their understanding. And I, and I guess that's where a lot of us fall down a little bit, right? Is, mm we don't think like a five or six year old and and not many of us take the time to try and think like a five, six. We, we just kind of say, well, they can't understand it. We'll teach that later when they're 15. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of uh, missed opportunities um, for these young kids. But when we, when we do that and don't get it wrong, I mean, I was that way for a long time and all of a sudden I realized I can include my two worlds together, you know, and this will, this, this could work for me, you know, and finally I did that. And, and I think you can, uh, anybody's, you can t- take something in your, your work world or, you know, your career and bring it back into your uh, coaching world and find a way to say, Hey, this can work for this. Man. Let's talk about like the, again, like folks in on this, this age group, like um, we always talk about the four corner model, right. And all that, like the, the social part for mm-hmm. this this age group, like, I mean, I, I think they're all. I think all those four corners are, are. Are. Do you think they're equally important at every age and stuff, uh, or are they? Is like the social part is that way more important at five years old and less important at fourteen, or how? Yeah. In your, in your like experience with understanding the behavioral part of young children, like how do those, uh, how do you, what, what's the most important part for you? At- um, in my opinion, I think, yeah, the, the psych social parts are more important for the really the younger ages. Um, if we can teach technical in there, which, you know, again, could be incorporated into that psych social, you know, uh, making them feel good about themselves on the ball. So then that's a plus, you know, when they're with their friends, that's a plus, you know, so I think those are the more important ones. I, I could be wrong here. I'm not like, uh, um, I'm not a, a sports therapist or anything like that, but, you know, or gym teacher, but I think that the, the activity part of it, you know, the um, physical part kids are going to do anyways, they're running around their backyard on a jungle gym and stuff, they're doing that. Um, so that comes along with them just with a ball. So I think if we focus more on the like, social part as the younger ages, I think all those other things start to come into play as well. How do you handle uh, ideas? So within each, within any group, right? You always have that 
two or three that are friends and they just, they always just want to be together, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. how do you approach and handle that with younger children? Like, do you just find ways for those three to always be together or most of the time? Or um, are you also wanting to expand their social kind of interaction with the, the other people within the group? Because I have groups where it's always like, you know, Tony, Billy, and Bobby is like, they always just want to be together. Right. So how much frustration are you willing to endure as a coach? <laughs> I guess that's the question. So um, a lot of times I will let them go and keep together because, you know, uh, that is part of their social group. And sometimes maybe that's why Johnny comes is because of the other two kids. So we let them have it. And, and then we try to incorporate another kid in there. So maybe they're in groups of four or groups of five. Uh, so they're together. Um, so that would expand their uh, social group as well. But then there's times where we will um, put them in different groups and we might say, hey, you're, you're, the, you're the group leader today. Why don't you pick a couple kids to come in? But you put, so if Johnny's his best friend, you make Johnny a group leader too. Oh, you guys can't be on the same group today. Okay. So now they're trying to expand that, that, that group. So you're giving them control and control to pick um, in a way of how, you know, how they're going to engage in the activities today. But for the most part, that's another thing that you're just going to, you're going to work with and make that helps yeah. you make your, your session, your, your game makes it more enjoyable. So it's mm -hmm. more of most of the time, let's keep friends together. And then occasionally let's broaden their horizons. And that's a, yeah, that's it. Like, I like that. That's a good idea in terms of when we do take them away, let's give them a, kind of benefit to that right right yeah 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 because ultimately again i think everybody wants control of their environment in a way you know so we're there as coaches we have ultimate control but it's okay for us to give up some control to just to to make the whole environment a better environment as well mm -hmm. yeah no that's good uh that's something i've been i see a lot of and I think in the beginning stages, I would always split them up in my early coaching career, right? I was like, no, you got to be with other people. And then as, as I slowly got older and wiser, I realized, well, like you said, some of these, that's the only reason they come. Right. Because yeah. of their friend. So mu as much as we can, we can keep them together. The, the thing I find hard is when it's the, the three friends that are maybe the best three players in the group. And then I have to try and find a way to still keep the activity or the game competitive. Right. That's, that's a challenge too. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely see that. Um, I, and we come across that, that as well. I guess that's in that sense, I mean, it's a little bit more, it looks tougher in that. Um, and that we're in that sense, you kind of just need to, give take that control and say this is kind of how we have to do it today but next next time i'm one who says never give a kid a promise because we tend to break our promises because for like especially soccer in sessions because it might not work out the way we want to the next oh no, you just or you so, just weren't thinking about it at the time right it's like oh well, yeah yeah I, yeah you said i could be with him in the third activity and it's like, oh yeah okay yeah and they remember oh yeah they, and then we the don't we're like oh man <laughs> right yeah, so I would say, you know, in, in that, uh, those cases, you want to keep it more competitive because you want to see um, how they can push themselves, that better group. Yeah, sometimes you just have to take that risk. And, in, and knowing that day, you might endure a little bit more frustration uh, from that kid. He might not want to, might not want to train. Um, but, and that's okay. You know, kids have up and down days. It becomes a life lesson as well for a kid. And we, we need to do that. What would you say is the most common like behavioral nah, not maybe issue but traits that you know about because of your training that the average guy like me doesn't even know is a thing well so again, that we should be aware of and, and that we should kind of yeah. think a little bit about when we design our, our sessions um yeah i think well, up until I heard about that foreign exchange student, I was thinking, you know, the, um, 
attention span, you know, what's their longest attention span, how, how much should we be talking uh, to keep them uh, focused with us. And this is even for younger kids, um, high school to younger, uh, in their ADHD, if they have like, you know, symptoms, and we all have symptoms of ADHD, but which ones are more heightened, you know, where they, where they struggle and then they start to have some behaviors, you know, and maybe not like, when I say behaviors, I'm not meaning like a temper tantrum or anything but maybe they're fooling around a little bit more. So I was always very conscious of that. You know, how can I keep these very short and I'm trying to always get better at that without talking as much. Um, so recognizing that, but also recognizing, like I've been pretty good at uh, recognizing when a kid is coming in and, you know, you can tell that the last couple of sessions and the games that their, their mood has just been low. You know, they're, not engaging as much with the kid, with the, their teammates. They're just coming to practice and then they're leaving immediately. They're not really, the things they used to do, they're not smiling as much. So, you know, just recognizing some of those social cues of, of a player. Okay, two things that rem remind me because I'm going to forget attention span. We're going to talk about that in a sec. Do you think it's a good idea or do you, uh, when you get new kids coming to the program, this is just something I just kind of thought of off the top of my head that we we don't do, that we probably, I think, should, is is almost have an email that goes out or a question to the parent just to say, is there anything we should be aware of? Is there anything that you want to tell us about your child and... Not, not just like, you know, it was when you kind of said the AD, you know, like, does your child yeah. have ADAC? Are they on medication? Or or even yeah. just, are there any things that, you know, they're, they're scared of? Or Yeah, I, I actually like, like that idea. Yeah, yeah I think that's... Help us out. What, what do I need, you know, if you were me, what, what, what do I need to know to make this more enjoyable? Yeah, I think a lot of programs want to say that they're... Um, so we're developmental based, we're individual based, you know, this is for your child. But if you really sit back and think like what you just said is how many of us are really thinking about that individual child, you know, sending out a questionnaire like that is like, hey, you know, what are some of the struggles? What are, you know, your concerns with them coming and training here? Um, you wanna make it so that it's formal, but at the same time uh, that the parent is going to wanna answer it. You know, we don't want them to say, oh, I don't want to answer that because the coach might not play them. We want to make it so that you are saying to the, the parents, hey, we're very individualized here as far as like a, as a person. You know, our, we, we develop as a team, but we're individual as a person. We want to get to know each and every single one of your kids so we can serve them best. You know, um, I think that's very important. Yeah, I like that idea. I mean, a classic, I mean... I think that's something we have to do. Like we need to, we, again, right. If the parent is going to be our partner in this, in this, mm -hmm. like there's a lot of stuff like, you know, just insight that we, we don't have, right. That if we knew about might explain a lot to us. Right. I mean, I, I remember a classic right. example. We had a, a player, a young kid had been, been with us for, for quite a number of years. Like I'm going to say like three years. And one night I was running a real simple activity where I had a set of red cones making a square, a set of yellow cones, a set of green cones, and a set of blue cones. And it was four squares spaced out. Everyone started in one square and whatever color I shouted out, you had to dribble to that color square and go stop your ball in the square. Right. And this player was one of my technically good players was absolutely horrible at this activity. Last into the square nearly every time. Mm. And we moved on and I didn't think much about it. And then the mom came to pick him up and I'm just like, is, 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 uh, you know, is Tommy okay tonight? I'm like, he was really struggling with this. And she's like, well, what are you doing? And I explained it. And her answer was, oh yeah, he's colorblind. I, I was just gonna say, I don't know if you saw me point to my eye. Yeah. I, I, I'm like, when well, Fuji started saying it, I'm like, he's colorblind. <laughs> yeah, but he, he didn't obviously come tell me. And then right, I was right. like, oh, that makes complete sense why he was so slow to move yeah. and was waiting to see where all the other kids were going. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So yeah. then, then I was like, okay, well, how would I now? How do I 
do that activity again and change it so that he can be good at it. But maybe simple, simple things like, like that. Um, but even maybe, maybe asking that question earlier on in the process. Yeah. May, I may not have remembered, but. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you say that like, and again, now that I'm, I'm thinking, taking it back to my work life, I have questionnaires like that. Not like for all my clients that when we go, we, uh, meet with the family for the intake and we ask all these questions, what activities they like to enjoy, you know, do they have a diagnosis? Well, you know, all this stuff. Now, again, we're behavioral health, but I ask all that stuff. I'm thinking when you start mentioning, I'm like, why haven't I done that? <laughs> you know, bring that I mean, even if it's my just coaching a, world. Yeah, even if it's a simple, just like, is there anything I need to know about your kid that's going to help yeah. me simple, yeah. better? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. All right, so my... See, I remember now, tension span. Tension span. <laughs> what is the attention span of a six-year-old? Oh, um, of a six-year-old. The oh, average... Typically. This this group, five, six, yeah. seven, like... Yeah, yeah, how yeah. Much, um, uh, how much can we talk to them? How do we're we, probably how... looking... For, for, for the average, we're probably looking around uh, a minute to three minutes if we're lucky. You know, a kid who's really, who's hyper-focused, you might get a little bit more time. Um, but yeah, you're looking a minute to three minutes of really quality um, uh, activity and then kind of need to stop, let's reorganize, maybe get another minute to three minutes of uh, quality activity. And then, you know, like kind of a lot of chunking, chunking up those activities. So yeah, minute to three minutes, I would think. <laughs> so we need to, uh, we need to try and, limit our uh, our lectures our coaching mm -hmm. points yeah. we, need to, we need to try and get our activities rolling quicker i guess and then yeah add or explain as we go along yeah and like I, said, I'm, I tend to talk and give a lot of open-ended questions and try to get them to reflect and at some points i'm like oh man we've been here for already a minute you know i gotta get to get back to the activity and cut it off because i'm doing the talking i keep asking questions like uh, I'm losing them. Let's go. <laughs> um, we were doing an activity. Uh, it was the us four coaches for our uh, Eagle Academy program. And um, uh, my cousin was running it. And the, it was probably more for the eight-year-olds than it was for the five. And this is still when we had all the groups together. And as my cousin was explaining it, and um, so he was explaining it and trying to get the kids organized, we both, my, my brother and I both looked at each other and says, he lost them. <laughs> you know, like right on cue, we both looked and said, he lost them. So we kind of had to jump in and try to help out. Um, and he did a great job at getting it going, but it was kind of like more for the eight-year-olds than it was the five-year-olds. So, so five, so six-year-olds attention span was just not there. With those younger, with those younger kids, the five, sixes, if that attention span is, is less, I mean, obviously, us sitting yapping to them needs to be shorter. But within within a given activity, you just said kind of, <clears throat> I think you said the term was like chunking the time. Like, would you, do you kind of need, are you saying that every minute and a half, two minutes, we should um, kind of add something new or change it slightly and just give them a different photo. So rather than, okay, we're yeah. going to dribble around the square for 15 minutes. It's, right. okay, I want you to try and do this for two minutes and then we're going to stop it real quick and be like, okay, now for the next two minutes, I want you to do this. And then the next two minutes, okay, we need to combine both of those. Just keep giving them like little bite-sized challenges, bite-sized right. changes to keep them... Yeah. I think so with that, with the chunking five to six year olds, you got to kind of realize that the first minute is probably still going to be a lot of coaching for you. You know, so it's going to be very slow until they get into it. So you kind of need to pre-plan that. So maybe you do the first minute of that and then maybe another minute and a half of them actually trying to do it on their own. And then you maybe take a 30 second break. And like you said, I like the idea of adding like adapting. So maybe we were, uh, dribbling around, just keeping the ball close inside of our foot, outside of our foot to dribble with the, the ball close. Now let's the second time, minute and a half, and still maybe plan in there. 
the first minute um, is, or you're going to take a minute to explain it and it's going to go slow. And then you give them that minute and a half of, all right, do it on your own. And we're going to do a step over this time. So it's kind of like, you got to play pre-plan that it's not going to go so well right at the, right off the bat. So you got to put that little bit of time in there as well, but still chunk the main activity. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've always, <laughs> found, I've always found with, uh, <clears throat> with the younger players, I need not necessarily more. I mean, when I first started, I would have 20 activities for them. Right. And then after about five years, I figured out that didn't work. But now I, whenever I have the youngest ones, I'm almost looking at my activity as I need, you know, to get through 10 minutes of an activity, I need five, four or five variations on the activity. I need, I need yep. to, and now I'm getting better. I'm getting to that point, you know, having a yep. lot more experience with this age group. I can see when I'm losing them. And that's when I'll add something new. Or I see that maybe they just need a little bit longer to start getting it. But I need, I need a definitely, you know, I can run the same activity with older players and I might only have one change to that activity in 10 minutes. But for the younger players, I definitely find not having, you know, having, whether you want to call it progressions, variation. I, with the young kids, it's variations for me. It's not necessarily right. well i'm going to make it harder now and i'm going to make it harder again it might be i'm going to switch the partners or yeah. i'm going to switch the teams or i'm going to switch where we start or i'm going to switch like slightly the objective right instead of going from that side to that side now i want you to go from that side to this side mm -hmm. just so i just keep challenging them to um focus on the next task yeah yeah, I like that. I mean, that's kind of what we do as well is trying to um, constantly incorporating something new. So it does, it gives them, some, like you said, the next task. It gives them something to think about during that. And it's not like they're not losing their attention within there. Yeah. Yep. I find my attention span is not very long sometimes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yep. If it's something you really enjoy, it probably goes a lot longer. If it's something that, you know, uh, I mean, for me, math or anything like that, I'm done. <laughs> um, but even uh, even when you're trying to, for, like, just having a conversation, you're like, your mind starts going, oh, what else can I, what else, you know, I want to mention this part too. Like, so then you're, you're, you're forgetting that you're still in a conversation, you know, like when I'm talking to other coaches, you know, it's like, oh, wait, wait, what were you saying? <laughs> You know, you come back to it, so yeah. I know, the problem for me now is just my brain, it just doesn't work as quick as I want, and I'm already like, I'm like, ah, oh, I, got, I got so many questions and so many problems for Corey. Right. Like, now I'm like, all right, we're gonna have to do it. We're gonna have to do a, a follow-up to this so I can sit down and write down all the behavioral problems I've ever seen. Right, <laughs> right. so have you ever, I, I did wanna mention, so you, you're um, talking about the like, behavior, have you, for even for like older kids, have you ever heard of motivational interviewing? No. So motivational interviewing, it's, it's a, a cognitive therapy um, uh, tool, I guess. There's a book and it's actually uh, for uh, sports. It's uh, Stephen Rolnick writes it. Um, actually, I might have it. Yeah. Got it on the shelf there? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So Let's this see. book here, I don't know if you see it. Okay. So, I mean, and it, it's about motivational interviewing. And it's, can, it's you, uh, can you send me a DM with that after and I'll share that, I'll share that with everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. um, but so motivational interviewing is, is kind of going back to how I was mentioning, um, you got to find the, the, the young athlete's motivation, you know, and you got to meet them where that motivation is, whether it's, you know, just to be there for the social aspect, um, what things they, they enjoy. Um, but then you start, so you incorporate it in there to find out what's going on with them. You know, what, what's the, why are you not so engaged in the activity and how can I get you engaged more into this activity? But it's, it's all about open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. Um, so like instead of uh, telling a kid what to do, it's you, where you're giving them an open-ended question of like, hey, how can you uh, 
when you're trying to receive the ball, what's a better way that you can receive it so that you can already be, you know, in the next motion to pass the ball off, you know, and what have we talked about before? So now you're getting them to think of, oh, if I open up my body, receive across my body, now I'm facing the direction I want to go. You know, so you're getting them to think about it rather than us giving them the answer. There's times where we should give them the answer, but in a lot of cases, especially training, and that's what we're there to do is help them develop is, you know, we, so we give them those open-ended questions to do it. Next time you see them do it, hey, Johnny, that was wonderful. You know, you opened up your body and you, and you, uh, you, you found that next pass. It was a lot smoother. I love how hard, how hard you're working at that. You know, so now you're giving them an affirmation. Um, maybe a reflection would be, what did you just do there? I saw you make that pass. How did you get from point from the path to receiving the pass to point B? So from point A to B, and you're the interconnection. How did that happen? You know, still kind of like an open-ended question, but again, they're reflecting on what they uh, had done. Now, is that the, is that um, is there any science behind that in terms of? If I come up with the solution myself, that I will learn it better than you. Yeah. You know, is there, is there any? It sticks with you longer. Rather, rather than you telling me, "Hey, John, face into the pitch and receive the ball across your body so you can go this way." Like yeah. if you ask me and I come up with the correct, and I have ownership. Bingo! You just said it. It's the ownership. It's it's the recognition that hey, I did this or I I, I problem solved. I found a solution that sticks with uh, with kids, adults, a lot longer than it does to be told. It goes in a lot of times if you're told to do it, if I tell you to do it, this is how you have to do it, one year out the other. You know, there's no ownership in it. It's, well, that's what coach wants, you know, um, and they forget it the next time. And you got that's what coach wants. You got to do it again. Um, not for everybody. But it's almost like the same thing with my wife. When 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 my idea is her idea, it's a fantastic idea. Right. I, mean, oh, yeah. I just haven't figured out how to use those uh those open ended questions to with her. Use it's just a matter of time. We we can go through a whole session of just open ended questions. Changing close ended questions to open ended, I'll help you out. <laughs> I find that I I really enjoy hearing like the five, six, seven year olds. I like hearing what your answers are. Right. Yeah. Because sometimes um, I find I learn more from that age group than I do others. And it kind of comes back to that. One of the first questions that they asked you about, what is a five, six, seven year old capable of learning? And I think for whatever reasons, there's many, a lot of us don't tap into the, the potential of, of, what they can actually learn right yeah i i completely agree i think um like i said they're coming out and they're playing they know the simplest answers and they they can and, and if we can build off of those simple answers um and it's simple to us but to them it's probably a little more complex but you can build off that and keep asking questions you're going to get a lot more not complex answers but a lot more insight into you know, what their answers are really. You know. Yeah, one, one thing I've been trying to, one thing I've been really trying to do more of as well is um, I, I find that even these very young young kids, they, they understand, they'll, they'll get, you know, the, the similar answer to what the question I asked them in terms of a concept. But then the, the big part is translating it. Can they do it? on the field and in a game and one of the things i've really been trying to ask more questions of recently is because i got to a point with a certain number of players where it's like i know you know what the concept is and what you should do now me as a coach trying to understand why do you not do it right when it comes to being in an activity on a game so one of the things i've been really asking a lot of our players more is is what what do, what do you see on the field? Like why, why yeah. did you, you know you're supposed to, for arm, but you know you're supposed to get open, but you're still standing behind the player going pass, pass, pass. Like, why? What do you see here? And, you know, so, some of the kids are like, well, well, I can just about say, I'm like, 
to their their perspective of the pitch, the field, the game is completely different, I find, in terms of like space and scale mm-hmm. and mine. Right. Yeah. I, I really love that. Um, and I I know it was on Twitter uh, probably a few months back, you know, that, that kind of that same concept, what you're just saying, you know, like um, see what the kids are, see what our players are seeing, you know, because we have a different perception of what they're really seeing one thing like um kind of going off topic is like i will constantly say to our players there are no topics <laughs> right, right okay so one of the things i say to my players is my high school players is what what's your when you're on the field what's your peripheral vision what what are you guys seeing oh everything that's right in front of us behind us i said okay so you're 360 degrees of what your vision is what's the parents um well they're above so they're seeing everything Thing from a top so things look the, the space and stuff looks bigger I said you're absolutely right what do the coaches on the sidelines um, see well you only see one side I'm like absolutely right that's all we see so who has the best answers to your questions when you're playing the game they, so some will say well the parents I said no think about it again who has the best answer well the coach no who has the best answer you because you're on the field you see time space um, you, all those things happen, that chaos all happen at once. You know what you can do, what you're capable of doing at that moment, whether you have the ball or don't have the ball. I said, you got to really, you know, like uh, focus on that, that chaos. Parents might sit up in the stands. So for high school soccer and tell you what to do, when to do it, why to do it, where, you know, they're going to tell you what to do, but you're not problem solving because they don't see the speed of the ball. They don't see the speed of the player coming at you. They don't recognize the space yeah. because it looks bigger to them, you know? So uh, and I, like I said, I kind of went off there, but um, yeah, getting kids to understand what they're actually seeing is different than what we see as coaches and parents. And I would assume that a five, six, seven year old's perspective of um, space, distance, speed, and depth and things like that is is much different than us oh way way different yeah uh, yep our brain is slightly more developed in some cases more developed more complex <laughs> um like our, our our problem solving might be i mean it, obviously it's quicker but like i said more complex we're thinking a five-year-old can get to that ball and still kick it and make a uh, turn their body and make a pass no a five-year-old is only going to go up They might turn the ball. They might try one of their moves, but they're all going to be clumped together and the ball is just going to be bouncing back and forth. And and let's, let's, you know, let's not change it all that much. Let them still do what they do, but can we pick out little chunks within there to find, you know, how can we maybe get them to pull the ball back a little bit more? So maybe overcorrect. Like here's my daughter. You had the ball right here. Everybody was in front of you. You were at the end. What could you have done to get out of that? Well, I can pull the ball backwards. Perfect. Let's do it. I'm going to put the ball here. We're going to play right away. She gets the ball. She pulls it backwards. Now what happens next? The whole clump comes around her. But at least we got her to think at that moment, how can I get out of this crowd? Because that's going to be, um, and I think you mentioned it on uh, one of the last, one of your last podcasts, but development's not linear, you know, and, and it's not. Yeah. Um, and this is what we got to constantly remember is some kids will be up and some down and, uh, on how they quickly develop and what their cognitive abilities are. But if we can just get that one little thing, that might give them down the road. Uh, it I might think, solve the problem down the road. I think also trying to understand as well the difference between, I mean, I think by now everyone should be getting to the point where we understand that learning is not linear for, for, for young players, but I also then kind of split it into the trying to take into account. It's not linear in terms of your technical ability or your understanding of how to play and concepts. And then even within that, like within technical ability, you may be really good at dribbling and suck at passing. Right. And in terms of your, you know, your, how to play that you may, you may be someone that understands, finding space and seeing space and you may be a young player that just just cannot grasp that concept yet right yeah 
Okay, so, I mean, we're definitely doing a part two of this, so I can write down all my questions. But for cool. for the, for today's takeaway, like what what's one or two things that you you would like impress upon you know anyone who's coaching five, six, seven year olds in terms of a couple of things that they should understand about that age group and and how we can um, be better coaches without you know having a better session yeah and kind of what's maybe one thing that you know is it is it that we just need more patience with this age group yeah. and, and more acceptance that hey there's a lot of shit going on that has nothing to do with you as the coach right yeah so um i tend to say to like our parents that look these sessions you know if you're coming to these thinking it's going to be perfect it's chaos you know, I like to call it controlled chaos. I'm going to control what I can control, but it's going to look chaotic. And that's okay because we all live in chaos at times anyways, and we got to problem solve constantly. So um, it's going to look like chaos. It, but as coaches, we need to be patient, and we need to design our sessions based off of who we're coaching. Not just the age group, but the players within. You know, whether if they, like a kid who uh, has – very low attention span, a kid who does come in with behavior problems, a kid who's shy and anxious. We need to design our sessions based off that and always plan um, like the variations, adaptions uh, that we can implement at any given moment. Um, I would also say is the, the, like the meeting, them, meeting them where they're at, what's their motivation, why are they here, is it social, is it, um, do they really want, you know, do they want to get better or is it better that their parents just want them involved in something, which is perfectly fine because we all want that from our kids. But how do we incorporate that into our learning activities? So rather than rather than designing our sessions for our five, six, seven year olds around soccer topics, so as to say, maybe design them a little bit more around their behaviors. So if we have a group who don't pay attention and are messing around and, and that kind of stuff, then Maybe we should be doing more activities that are even more game-like or just even more games and then work backwards from there. And then the other thing I think you're saying is, I think kind of a, a common thing from our chat today, right, is don't be afraid to like sit down and talk to five, six, seven-year-olds. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're going awesome. to... Well, they're, they're yeah, going ask them what, why they're here, you know, like what... And a lot of them, you know, might come back and say, I'm here to play soccer. Yeah, but what part of soccer? What, what do you get out of it? What do you want? You know, and, and it is hard to talk to a five-year-old, but again, I don't think we give them enough. I don't know. I have, some pretty, I have some pretty good discussions with five-year-olds, better, <laughs> yeah, better than many yeah. adults, I have to. Yeah. <laughs> right. Cool. So, Corey. I, I did want to take away the, the say to, you know, you is like, I, I think you hit the nail on the head as um, as well as I say, meeting that kid's motivation and getting to know them, having a, I would really encourage that, that kind of questionnaires to parents. What do we need to know about your child? I think that's huge for, for us, especially those younger kids. Yeah, I'm going to like get that idea. done this week. I'm going to send out an email to all of our parents and just basically very simply, right? Like, hey, sorry we didn't ask before, but is there anything that you can tell us about your child that's going to help us coach them better, provide a better environment or anything, just anything we need to be aware of. Yep. Yep. I love it. I think if we all just started there and did that next week, that would probably give us again, more insight into some of these players, some of our players. And then I find the more, the more, the more you know about each player, the less, maybe the less frustrated you are. Maybe a couple of those kids that are having trouble focusing. Maybe there's some shit going on that, explains yeah. that quite simply right yep absolutely yep yeah. all right man we'll uh i'm right. gonna start writing down all my questions for you so next time i'm really gonna uh, pick your brain um perfect I love have, it. have a great weekend it was a really interesting chatting to you man yep. cool awesome i love chatting to you too thank you DM me that link to that uh book and i'll check that out yep definitely will perfect thanks man yep bye